Hey friends and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Wendy and I'm with Inspire Ministries and truly I am so glad that you landed on today's video. Today we are continuing in our topic about what it means to be a godly wife. What it means to be a woman of God as described in the scriptures. What the Bible has to say about us and being women of God who are married to unbelieving and believing spouses. Today is video number two. I'll go ahead and link up above the other video that I did last week on this very same topic. You do not want to miss that one. I would strongly encourage you to watch that one first. So this came to me, this idea, from a couple different people who wanted me to talk about marriage. And truly, it is one of those things that is near and dear to my heart. You can listen about my own personal story in that first video that I did last week on being a godly woman, being a godly wife. And you can listen to my story and you can hear about how I met my husband, how many years we've been married, and all of that good stuff. I will apologize beforehand that I look like this. I've got some blotches on my face because I got into something over the weekend, some poison ivy, poison oak, poison something, and I have been hurting and burning and itching in my skin ever since, so I can't wear makeup. This is the best that you are going to get today, but I didn't want to delay in getting this message out to you because I feel like this today is a really important continuation in our conversation about what it means to be a godly wife. You know, I want to say first and foremost that everything that I talk about, everything that I have talked about, and everything that we are getting ready to talk about as it relates to being a godly wife will fly in the face of the rest of the world into what what the world will tell you that a godly wife is supposed to look like. This is not common. This is not popular. And so this teaching that is based on biblical principles isn't going to be something oftentimes that will be favorable, especially to those of you who have unbelieving friends. So before I get started with this lesson today and all that we are going to talk about, I just want to give you some encouragement that oftentimes when you are living according to scripture and how the Bible teaches us that we are supposed to live. It is completely anti-world. And so oftentimes we get around unbelieving friends who say, that is crazy. What do you think you're doing? Living in the 1950s? This is not true for us in modern day times. And I'm telling you it is. Why? Because it's scriptural. Why? Because it's what Jesus has given us in his word as directives for wives and for husbands. So I want to give you encouragement right out of the gate that nothing that we are about to talk about right now is worldly at all. It is all about being godly. It's all about being rooted in our faith. It's all about grounding ourselves in scripture and learning to live with our spouses, love our spouses from a biblical perspective. So with all of that being said, let's just hop in to today's video. Okay, so in the beginning of this particular message, I want to take us to the book of Ephesians. Now, if you have your Bibles handy, I would love for you to go get it because I want you to follow along as I read these scriptures. I'm going to be reading a ton of scriptures today, and I want you to see for yourself what is being communicated and how it's being communicated. So if you have your Bibles, go get it. Put it on pause right now. Go get your Bibles. Come back here, and let's dive into the Word of God together. Okay, so we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to be reading verses 22 through 33. And I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified Bible. Now, oftentimes, in as of late especially, I have been referencing that I'm reading out of the Amplified Classic. But for today's purposes, I want to show you what Ephesians 5, 20 through 33 says according to the Amplified, just the regular Amplified Bible. So if you have your Bibles and you've turned it to your NLT or ESV or NASB and it looks different than what I'm going to read, that's the reason why, because I'm reading out of the clear 
plain amplified version. Let me just get started. Again, it's Ephesians 5, 22 through verse 33, and it says this, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives should be subject to their husbands in everything, respecting both their position as protectors protector and their responsibility to God as the head of the house. Husbands, love your wives. Seek the highest good for her and surround her with a caring, unselfish love, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of God, so that in turn he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be wholly set apart for God and blameless. Even so, husbands should and are morally obligated to love their own wives as being, in a sense, their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own body, but instead he nourishes and protects and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members, parts of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined and be faithfully devoted to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery of two becoming one is great, but I am speaking with reference to the relationship of Christ and the church. However, each man among you, without exception, is to love his wife as his very own self with behavior, loving kindness, and the wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband, that she notices him and prefers him and treats him with loving concern, treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him dear. And that's the end of verse 33. So I want to point out a couple things in this text that I believe are very important. The first one right out of the gate is verse 22 that says, wives be subject. Now we talked a lot about this last week when we talked about 1 Peter chapter 3, but I think it's important to reiterate this here. In loving with subjection or being in subjection to our husbands. Now the word subjection actually means being under the influence influence or having allegiance to a certain individual. So what is being said here is that wives are subject. They have an allegiance that they owe to their husbands or they are under the influence of their husbands. Now, there is no indication on whether this is to be only believing spouses or unbelieving spouses and believing spouses. So we have to take the stance that this means that we are in subjection to our husbands regardless of their spiritual standing. Now, I want to give you some encouragement when you think about this today, is when you think about wives being in subjection to their husbands, what does that do for your mindset? It takes you right to, well, they're better than me, they're superior than me, and I will not be outdone. I will not let someone master over me. But think about what we said last week. In being under subjection to our husbands, we are in subjection, true subjection to God. So the order in the family unit is God, spouse, wife, kids. That is the order. And so ultimately, our children, right, they answer to us as their parent, and we answer to them. To God, we answer to Him on behalf of our children. Well, the same thing goes for our husbands. He answers to God with how He led the family, how He loved the family, how He protected His family, how He respected and honored His family. And so we are to live in subjection to our husbands. Now, I want to say this. Love is always in subjection. It doesn't matter. If you love someone, you are always in subjection. So I want you to think about this. Think about Jesus. 
His life was the embodiment of love. He was love while he walked on the earth, while he did miracles on the earth, while he taught on the earth, while he died on the earth. He was the full embodiment of love and he did not come to be ministered to. He came to minister. He came to glorify the Father. He came as a suffering servant. So I want us to think about this in terms of being in subjection to. Because of Jesus' subjection to the Father, he allowed himself to be a man, to come and live around sin-filled people in this sin-sick place, filled with sin and agony and pain and lots and lots of persecution. And still he came to minister to us. He did not come to be the one ministered to. He did not come to be the one served, but to serve. And so I think that this gives us a ton of encouragement when we think about our subjection to God through our spouse. Can we do that? Can we embody love and can we have such awe and reverence for God that we could then live in subjection to our husband regardless of what kind of person he is because he is ultimately responsible for us and because we love God. We want to do well and please the Lord. I want to also look at that very last verse in the Amplified because I think that it's so beautiful. It says, the wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband. Respects and delights. Can you even imagine how different our world might look if we respected our husbands and we delighted in him? So oftentimes I feel like we are in competition with them. We want to be somebody. We want to prove ourselves in society. And so ultimately, that goes against the idea that God had, the plan and the purpose and the design that he had for marriage. You know, I told my husband this past weekend, I said, you know, we were at an ice cream store and and we were looking at husbands and wives and we were looking at how they interacted with one another. And I said, babe, you know what I would say? That I would say the number one reason why we see most of the problems in government, in our school systems, in our family units, in our churches, in all of these areas, the number one reason why I think we see that is because there is a definitive upset in the order of the family unit. We have lost our awe and reverency for God. And because we have, we've lost our respect and our honor for our spouses. And if we aligned that, if we lined ourselves up in subjection under our husband, knowing that he's ultimately responsible for us because we had such great fear and awe and reverence for God and we stayed at home and we taught our kids and we protected the values of the home and we set out to be as morally and 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 as godly and as clean purity clean as we possibly could, we wouldn't see all the things that we're seeing in the world. We wouldn't see women competing with men. We wouldn't see women fighting with their husbands. We wouldn't see this this upset in the entirety of our nation and of our society because we would be in the order of the family unit that God designed. I really, I truly believe that. And this shows how important the woman's role is in her home. The wife's role in her home is stronger and it's greater and it is more privileged than we ever get it credit for, give it credit for. He says, he says, and his wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband. And then in the brackets, it says that she notices him that she prefers him, that she treats him with loving concern, treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him dear. Listen, I want to be so brave as to say something today that really might get in your face. 
And I, I really want to say with love that I don't care if it gets in your face because I believe that truth needs to be said about this subject. No one's talking about it. Because even in our Christian circles, even in the best Christian books that we have available today, we would never admit this to be true. But I believe that all of the upset that we see in our families, all of the arguments that we see, all of the disunity that we see, all of the separations that we are seeing. Yes, it has a lot to do with, with the fact that there is a husband who is either controlling or manipulative or, you know, just doesn't want to follow Jesus or is, you know, completely living in sin. Yes, I believe that that is a thing. But I believe with my whole heart that if we as women began to honor our spouses the way that the and, and start seeing them the way that God sees them, regardless of what they're doing this side of eternity, regardless if they give us the honor that we feel like we're due, even if they never help out at home, they never pick up a dish, they, they never mow the lawn, even if they never do any of those things, I believe that our world would change if the women in our homes paid more attention to loving our spouses and raising our babies and focusing on the value of home life. And we didn't spend so much time going out in the world partying with our friends, uh, seeing to it that we got a break from our kids every now and then, if we, if we focused entirely on our families the way that God intended for us to do, we would not see the turmoil and the upset that we are seeing in our world today. Look at this. She notices him. She prefers him. She treats him with loving concern. She treasures him. She honors him. She holds him dear. I'm going to share with you an important story in the Old Testament later on in this video. You do not want to miss out on that. Please stick around to the end of this video. I'm going to share with you out of 1 Samuel something you've got to see. And then I'm going to share with you three more things that I believe that we can begin saying today to our spouses and with our spouses that can really, really change the trajectory of our home life. So I want to read you a commentary that I read that I was just stumped by because I believe that above everything else, when we think about loving our spouses and honoring our spouses, what we need to do above all else is place the character of God as the highest thing that we aim for, that we are placing our character as a Christ follower as number one, as the first and foremost primary thing in our life. I, I think it's really important that this Ephesians 5 section, it begins in verse 1 with being imitators of Christ. Being imitators of Christ. He starts this whole conversation about wives and husbands by saying imitate Christ. So that needs to be the number one priority for us. When we think about honoring our spouse, are we viewing it like we are valuing our godly character above everything else in our life. That's got to be the first and foremost thing that we're looking at. I want to read this commentary to you because I thought it was a wow moment. And I want to start it out by saying this. God sees you. He knows you. He knows what situation you're facing in your marriage. He knows the brokenness that you have. He knows the fear that you are in. He knows the long nights that you have suffered worrying about your marriage. He sees you. He knows you. And I want to read this to you. It says, Wives should be meek and have a quiet spirit, even under her heathen husband's wrongdoings. She should not say or do anything to cause dispeace. This won't be a popular response, nor accepted by the world. What is it that I just talked about? None of this that we're talking about today, it's going to be popular. None of it's going to be, none of it's going to be accepted by the world. 
The world may say she's regarding herself no better than a slave. But God. But God is also looking on the spirit. And in his sight, which by the way is the only one that matters, she's being godly and honoring. And that's all that matters. The way God takes to overcome evil in us, in our grievances, is to heap goodness on us. If a Christian wife would conquest her unbelieving husband for Jesus, she must be an imitator of that divine procedure. I need for us to think about this because this is really important. The way that God overcomes the evil that's in us, the way that he can look at us and love, love us, regardless of our sin, regardless of our failings, regardless of our failures, the way that he overcomes that evil in us and the grievances that we have given to him and that we have heaped on him, the way that he does that is by lavishing us with grace, by lavishing goodness upon us and loving us anyway. And because we are to be imitators of Christ and imitators of Christ in us, then we have no other, we have no other choice than to live with the obligation to be an imitator of that divine procedure, that we have to do it the same way that Jesus would do it. And friend, I know he sees you. He knows you. He understands your circumstances. He has seen you up in the middle of the night, pacing the floor, wondering how you're going to love your husband for one more day because it's hard. I get it. But back to that first Peter verse that we talked about last week where he says, that the way to win your husband is through a godly life. It is by demonstrating God in us. It's not by the words we say, but it's by the, the life that we live. That is the way that we win him over. And part of that has to do with honoring him regardless if you consider that he's worthy. Loving my husband during the most challenging seasons of our marriage has proven to be such an enormous benefit for my spiritual life. I can't even tell you. The times that I was able to love in pain and honor when he didn't deserve to be honored, in the times that I loved him, even when it was most difficult to love him, was simply the way that Christ loved the church when she was the unloveliest and the hardest to love. So we have to remember that. This is honoring God above all else. It's honoring Father God with our life. And it matters. I want to take you to a very important biblical story in the Old Testament. Again, if you have your Bibles, I want you to see this for yourself. I'm going to be in my New Living Translation, and I'm going to show you a story about a woman named Abigail. Now, Abigail is not somebody that is talked about a lot in Scripture. She's only given a little bit of real estate within our Old Testament, but she is a godly character that I believe we have a lot to learn about here in 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles again, I want you to turn it to 1 Samuel 25, chapter 25. And this in my Bible is a header that says, Abigail prevents David from committing murder. Now this story is in, I'm going to set this up for you. It's after Samuel has died and David is moving down through the wilderness, it says, and that he um, needed some provisions and he needed for him and his warriors, all the men in his army to have a place to stay and have some provisions, including food for his troops. He needed a place to stay. And so he came to this place that was, um, that was owned by a homeowner and his wife by the name of Nabal and his wife 
was Abigail. And what it tells us about Nabal is that he wasn't a very good man, that he was a very bad man, that he was not, not very kind, not very good, he wasn't very decent, and he was a descendant of Caleb. But he was married to a woman named Abigail, who scripture tells us in 1 Samuel 25, verse 3, it says this man was Nabal and he was married to Abigail, who was a sensible and beautiful woman. So first out of the gate, we need to see that, that she was a sensible and she was a beautiful woman. Now it says that David sent word to Nabal because he was needing, he was going through his town, he was going through where Nabal owned all of this land, all of this cattle, was evidently a rich man. And, he, and David said, you know what? There was a time that we helped you. So there was a time where in your greatest need, you reached out to us, you came to us, and we helped you. And we're only requesting that that same thing be done for us. We're needing a place to stay. We're needing some provisions. Could you comply? And Nabal responds, and he has this horrible response. He, we see this in uh, verse 10. He says, who is this fellow David? Nabal, Nabal asked, who does he think he is? Like, I don't know who he thinks he is because he's come here. We don't have anything for him. We don't want to help him. Isn't he just the son of Jesse? Like he's nobody. He said, should I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've slaughtered for my shears and give it to some band of outlaws who come from who knows where? So he's acting as if he doesn't even know who David is at this point. And he's like, we don't have anything to offer him. I don't know who he thinks he is. I don't think that he is anyone special and I'm not going to help him out at all. And so then it says in verse 12, so David, so David, uh, so David's young men returned to him and told him what Nabal said. And David's response was this, get your swords, get your swords. I love this, that this is the only response that a warrior is conditioned to have, right? Let's go fight. Let's go out to battle. Let's fight this guy. I'm going to take him out. He, he owes me. I deserve right? He's got this attitude. And then it says, meanwhile, <laughs> love this. Verse 14, meanwhile, you know, there's got to be a good woman here somewhere. Meanwhile, it says, one of Nabal's servants went to Abigail and told her, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our masters, but he screamed insults at them. These men have been very good to us and we never suffered any harm from them. Nothing was stolen from us the whole time that they were with us. Verse 16. In fact, day and night, they were like a wall of protection to us and the sheep. You need to know this and figure out what to do. I love this. They're going to the wife of Nabal, the, the one who's actually a bad man, the one who actually hasn't done a God honoring thing, the one who actually is to blame for all of this. And the servants are looking to the wife to do something about it. Like I'm coming to you. We need you to know that you need to take care of this situation. And I love this. In verse 18, Abigail, it says, wasted no time. She just wasted no time. She quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two wives skins full of wine, five sheep that had been slaughtered, nearly a bushel of roasted grain, a hundred clusters of raisins, 200 figs, and said to her servants, go on ahead, I will follow you shortly. But she didn't tell her husband Nabal what she was doing. So what she was doing is she was planning on providing for David and his men. Then it says, as she was riding, this is verse 20, as she was riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, she saw David and his men coming toward her. David had just been saying, a lot of good this did to help this fellow. We protected his flocks in the wilderness and nothing he owned was lost or stolen, but he has repaid me evil for good. May God strike me and kill me if even one man in his household is still alive tomorrow. Wow. I love this. In verse 23, listen to this. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed before him. She fell at his feet and said, I accept all blame in the matter, my Lord. Please listen to what I have to say. I know Nabal, now she's talking about her husband. I know Nabal is a wicked and ill-tempered man. Please don't pay any attention to him. He is a fool, just as his name suggests, but I never even saw 
the young man that you sent. Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands, let all your enemies and those who try to harm you be cursed as Nabal is. And here is a present that I, your servant, ha, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with an everlasting dynasty, for you are fighting the Lord's battles, and you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. Verse 29, Even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. And this is the verse that I want you to see. Verses 30 and 31. When the Lord has done, she's still talking to him. When the Lord has done all he has promised and has made you leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. And when the Lord has done these great things for you, please remember me, your servant. So let's think about this. It's not her husband. David wasn't her husband at this point in the story. But she was taking ownership of what her husband had did. And she said, please forgive me. Count it as my fault. Put the blame on me. And she says, The Lord will reward you with a lasting dynasty, for you are fighting the Lord's battles. What is she doing here? She is reminding David of who David is. She is reminding him of his position. She's reminding him of his responsibility. And she is reminding him of his reward in the Lord. And I love that. She said, you are fighting the Lord's battles and you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. Even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe, David. I need you to remember who you are and whose you are. But the point of the story that gets me every time I read it is when she says, when the Lord has done all that he has promised and you are leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record. What if we behave this way towards our husbands? What if we love them unto the Lord so much that when they did something wrong, when they misused their words, when they didn't do something that we wanted them to do, when they hurt us with our words, right? Said something that maybe hurt us or upset us or got us angry about something. When they didn't act in the godly manner that we felt like they needed to act, could we say, husband, oh, please don't let this be a blemish on your record. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor your position as the head of this household too much to let this be a blemish on your record, to let this be the reason why you go down. Do you know what she did here? She protected David from doing something that he might have paid for for the rest of his life. She prevented him with kindness and love and practicality in her provisions. She served someone who wasn't even her spouse in that moment as a way to honor and glorify the Lord. She says, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Whatever you do, don't let this be a blemish on your record. I love this so much, and I believe that we as wives, we can honor our husbands this way. We can have such reverence and such respect and such awe for the Lord that we would not want our husbands' lives to be jeopardized by something that they say or do. We, we would not want to jeopardize what they could inherit 
of the Lord if they honored and chose to honor him with their life. It's huge. It's really, really huge, and it's something for us to think about. I want to end this video with three things that I believe that we could begin saying to our husbands. I shared with you three things last week. I'm going to share three things with you this week, things that I believe that we could start saying today. The first one is don't let this be a blemish on your record. I believe that we could speak that over our husbands. And listen, we have to be careful. Don't say it with a cynical spirit. Don't say it with the hopes of being honored back. Don't do it with an agenda. Do it because you love God. Do it because you fear the Lord. Can we say, Trevor, in my case, Trevor, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Whatever you do, I love you enough to protect you from the sin that can so easily entangle us. I love you so much and I love God in you so much and I fear the Lord on your life so much that I will not let this be a blemish on your record. I love you too much. Can we say that? It matters. The second thing that I believe that we can start doing is saying, I love you for this, fill in the blank, and be as specific as we can. I did this with my daughter and my son-in-law a couple weeks ago when we were in Tennessee visiting them. It happened to be their two-year anniversary. And I said, hey, listen, you know what your dad and I do is every single year that we're married, when we sit down and we celebrate that year, whatever we're in, we do that many things that we love about the other person. So for instance, Year 13, when we were married for 13 years, we sat down and said, okay, share with each other 13 things that we're grateful for or 13 things that we love about the other person. So I said, let's sit down and talk about two things that each of you love about the other person. I think it's really an important thing to do, but I think it also can become a great habit that we do in our life. Can we do it every day? Can we do it every week? Can we start by doing it every other week and maybe and start to incorporate that as a habit in our life? Can we say, I love you for the way that you always take out the trash and I never have to ask you to do it. I love you for the way that you look at me when you first wake up in the morning. I love the way that you raise our boys. I love the way that you, you drive because you get us safely to our destination. You are a really cautious driver. You see, can we be as specific as we possibly can about our love and our respect and our honor for them? And then the third thing that I want to share with you is something that just happened this morning. My husband and I got into a little argument about something. I'm going to just be honest with you. It was about 5.30 this morning. He was making his coffee. I was making his breakfast for him and his lunch before he left for the day. And I was really frustrated because I have this rash that I have on my face and I was frustrated. I didn't feel well. It hurt. It was itchy. I was bogged down with it. I've had this before. And when I had this three years ago, it lasted for like two months. And so I'm like, now it's on my face. And I, I will admit I was just complaining about it. And he said something to me that made me like, okay, well, you're not really being empathetic and sympathetic to my situation. And I don't need you to fix it, right? Because men tend to be fixers. So I'm like, I don't need you to fix it. I just need for you to listen to me complaining. And he was, he got mad and I got mad and pretty soon we were mad at one another and he ended up leaving the house. And yes, we said we loved each other, but we said it like a grumbly complaining kind of way. And do you know something that happened? He sent me a text shortly after he left the house and he apologized. And he said, I'm so sorry for doing that. And I'm so sorry that I upset you. It was never my intention. And we had this dialogue back and forth and I apologized. And then he talked about how I could do these practical things to help me today. And, and I talked about just how I, I'm, I'm gonna be fine. I just needed to get some things off of my chest. And I'm sorry that I got upset. And do you know what he finished the conversation up after he told me that he loved me? He said this, I'll try to do better. I'll try, I'll try to do better. In that moment, I didn't even know how to behave. And in that moment, I thanked God for a spouse that I don't deserve. But I started to think about, is that a way that we can begin to incorporate in our life? Is that something that we could start doing today that could really make a difference? Instead of arguing our position and telling 
the other person why we did what we did and why we're so angry and we just need to be mad. No, no, we don't. We don't need to be mad. We don't need to voice our opinion. We don't need to have a platform in order to communicate our, our dislike or our upset about whatever it is that we're going through. We don't. What we need to do is love each other well and honor one another well. But do you know that that means even if you're the only one who is honoring, you still are required to do it because it's doing it unto the Lord. And can I say... You know, I know that I would say, if I felt like I had grieved the Holy Spirit or upset Jesus in any way, I know that I would say to Jesus, I'll try to do better next time. Please forgive me. I'll try to do better. So can we do that with our spouses? Can we do that with our friends? Just with people in general, can we say, you know what, I was wrong. I didn't handle that the right way, and I will try to do better. Because the only thing that we can offer the only thing that we can offer our spouses is a willingness to love better and a determination to love like Jesus and to be imitators of Jesus Christ. Friend, I hope that you have appreciated this video. I know that this is not easy to hear, but it's so worth it for us to be investing in our marriage this way. If you've liked this video, I pray that the one thing that you do is that you will share it with somebody who you love. Someone in your life who needs to know these hard truths. Not as a, I told you so, but as, and I love you so much that I am willing to help you to invest in the places of your life and of your marriage that really need help. I pray all the time for you. I pray for you because I know that it's hard and I know it's challenging and I'm in the boat with you. I do not come from a place of having it all together, but I have been through some of these things that have helped me that I'm hoping that I can lovingly pass on to you. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, become a part of this family. I love you and until next time, I pray that you are investing in your marriage, loving your spouse well, and having an awesome day with Jesus. Bye, friend.